I want you to try to visualize that scene that we've just had read for us. Jesus has been on the hillside above Galilee. Uh, chapter 5, verse 1 of Matthew uh, tells us that he went up onto the mountain, followed by great crowds. His disciples are closest to him, and he sits and begins to teach them. It's what we now know as the Sermon on the Mount. Uh, you may not be very familiar with uh, much of the Bible, but you probably know about this, don't you? Uh, there'd be familiar phrases, familiar um, uh, teachings that you've you've heard before are uh, the beatitudes uh, you know the, those that go blessed are the poor in spirit for theirs is the kingdom of god and so on uh, phrases like you are the light of the world uh, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you what we know is the lord's prayer was also incorporated in that uh, that teaching he tells his disciples lay up treasures in heaven uh, don't be anxious ask and it will be given you and he, then, he also tells a story that we've all heard, I'm sure, about the wise man who built his house upon a rock. We don't know how long he was there, uh, but the great crowds stayed with him. No man spoke like this man. Wouldn't you have stayed? I think you'd been, as, you'd been with them astonished at his teaching. That what, that's what we read uh, about the crowds there. They were astonished at his teaching. And I think you would have been, uh, wouldn't you? S suppose you'd been there. How would you have reacted? Wouldn't you have been fascinated by his describing a kind of life and a lifestyle that seemed so different from everything uh, you'd heard before? This was teaching, wasn't it, that, that made you feel the difference between this kind of life and your life. The difference between these priorities and your priorities. This was teaching for which you'd need a changed life if ever you were going to aspire to it. I guess there were two ways you could have reacted, and I'm sure there were those in the crowd who reacted in two different ways. They're the same ways that people react to the teaching of Jesus these days. And I think you'll know what those reactions are. Of course, everyone loves the Sermon on the Mount. Uh, but the problem is that while many uh, love the sentiments, they turn away from applying them to, to their lives. That's how one group reacts, isn't it? Happy with the morality of what Jesus was teaching, but not really interested in a, in a radical uh, change of life, change of lifestyle. And then the other reaction is, of course, that people actually hear what he said, especially what he had to say about asking, seeking and knocking. Let me remind you the, of Jesus' words in, that are recorded for us in, in Matthew 7, verses 7 to 8. Ask and it will be given you. Seek and you will find. Knock and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives. The one who seeks finds, and to the one who knocks, it will be opened. Which one are you? Happy with the morality, but not really interested in the change of life, or actually someone who wants to ask, to knock, to seek? Well, all of that's really the background to our, our story this morning that we had read. It begins at the beginning of chapter 8 with these words, When he had finished these sayings, he came down from the mountain. The crowds are still with him. Uh, there's no social distancing going on here. The road, the, the road is packed with people. And then we read, Behold, a man with COVID-19 came to him. Here's someone with a high temperature and a persistent cough. And he's coming to Jesus and he has no mask. The man's infectious. This is a man from whom the crowds withdraw in horror. Matthew uses the word behold, look. Can you, can you see the crowd scattering when they see this man? Can you see the, the circle of space that appears around the man? Uh, where no one would dare to step. Okay, it wasn't COVID-19. Of course it wasn't COVID-19. It was leprosy. 
Did you know the rule for approaching a leper was that you were not allowed to uh, approach more than four cubits, to have a, a space of four cubits between you and the leper to stay safe. A cubit is about a foot and a half. That's six feet, two metres. Uh, it's familiar, <laughs> isn't it? But there's one man who stands in the middle of this circle. Uh, the, the crowd is scattered. There's a man there with leprosy and they're avoiding him like the plague, I guess. But there's one man who stands in the middle and it's to him that the leper comes. It's him that the leper approaches. And the leper is on his knees. There's a conversation between the two of them and Jesus reaches out and touches him. The crowd's hushed. As far as the crowd can see it, Jesus has just made himself ritually, ceremonially, maybe even physically unclean. He is now like the leper. Can you imagine the horror that goes through the crowd as they watch the, this event? If track and trace existed in those days, they'd have a field day, they'd, they'd have their work cut out, wouldn't they, with these, these crowds who had been uh, amidst whom the leper had been, and now Jesus was there, uh, as contaminated as the leper, in effect, as far as ritual was concerned. But our concern this morning isn't the crowd. We're not asked to behold the crowd, we're asked to behold this exchange between Jesus and the leper. Look at verse 2. For something extraordinary is going on. Far from Jesus becoming contaminated by the leper, the leper is being healed instantly and radically by Jesus. Here enacted at the foot of the mountain... It's a picture of that radical transformation required by Jesus' teaching up the mountain. We couldn't actually want a better illustration of, of with this leper and the exchange with Jesus, a better illustration of those words, ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives, and the one who seeks finds, and to the one who knocks, it will be opened. I want you to follow me as we look at what's going on. Because perhaps you need this radical transformation too. In your own life. Perhaps it's not COVID-19. It's almost certainly not leprosy. But there's something far worse far more contagious and far more deadly that infects people like you and me. The Bible calls it sin. Sin's not just to do with what we do. It's much deeper than that. It's to do with what we are and who we are. The Bible pictures leprosy as a, as a picture of that condition. Leprosy is a contagious disease that, that begins with the loss of all sensation in parts of the body. Muscles waste away. Tendons contract until hands become like claws. Ulceration follows and then there comes a progressive loss of digits of fingers, of toes as a result of the loss of sense, damage because of sensation loss. And with it comes dreadful social isolation. The cry of the leper, as you probably heard, was unclean, unclean. That's what sin does. First we lose sensation, sensitivity to evil. Then it takes hold, it gnaws away at us. It destroys us. And crucially, it separates us from God. There's a great gulf between the sinner and God, far more than six feet. We're unclean, unclean, and he's of two pure eyes to behold evil, the Bible says. 
And this gulf will last for eternity, unless we, like this leper, are prepared to come kneeling to Jesus, asking, seeking, finding. I want to ask this morning, are you like that leper? Then you need to come to Jesus, as he did. There's no other cure for sin. There's no vaccine available for this. And you need to understand as we look at this story that there were three things needed by this leper. And the three things that you need if you're going to come to Jesus and find spiritual cleansing. You're going to come to find forgiveness, to find acceptance, to find a new birth, a new start, a cleansed heart. Three things needed. Firstly, you don't just have to need a need. You need to, to understand that you've got a need. You, you have to know your need. What was his need? It was to be clean. He may have had to face social isolation, poverty, shame, humiliation, being despised by others. But this man knew that he, he didn't simply want to be treated better, to live in a society that was more tolerant, more inclusive, more accepting of diversity. He didn't just want to be accepted, he wanted to be clean. And he knew how terrible his problem was. It was evident for him. He knew he had a disease for which there was no cure. He knew that other people, including his family, had given up on him as having a hopeless condition. He had no one who would or could take him to Jesus. No one would come near to help him. They couldn't approach, could they? He had no promise, promise that Jesus would heal him. Jesus had never healed a leper before, and actually this leper had had no invitation from Jesus or from the disciples to approach Jesus. And so there he is, ashamed and alone in the crowd, deeply aware of his need. You see, that's our great need. Not just that we've got a need to be cleansed by Jesus. Our greatest need is to, 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 to know, to understand, to acknowledge that need. That's what you have to do if ever you're going to come to Jesus. Unless you see your need, you won't come. A man who's ill but, but ignores the symptoms will never go to the doctor. That's perhaps a bigger problem for men than it is for, for women. Men are notoriously reluctant to see a doctor. It's often their wives who nag them. You're, you're ill, you, you, you need to go and see a doctor. But as far as sin is concerned, there's no distinction between men and women. Boys, girls. We're all sinners and we all need to understand that. The symptoms are evident. But as long as you don't acknowledge that, you'll never go to Jesus. Are you, are you living in denial, thinking you can get yourself back on track? Is, is pride keeping you from acknowledging, even to yourself, that you're a guilty sinner and that you must go to Jesus? That's your first need, to know your need. And the second need was to ask. Knowing your need will get you nowhere except despair. There's no answer if there's no question. <laughs> That's kind of obvious, isn't it? Behind his asking, of course, was his his confidence that Jesus could help him. A leper would no more go to a, a priest for help or a rabbi for help than we would go to a butcher to have our eyes tested. If we have a need, 
We've got to go to the one who can meet that need. Which is what the leper did. But using that word again, behold, see, look. See how he came. He didn't just come with, a, with an awareness of his need. He came on his knees and cried out to Jesus. That, of course, means he came humbly. You have to be aware, you have to be wary, you have to be careful that pride doesn't keep you from coming to Jesus. Pride's a real enemy of the message of the gospel, of the Christian gospel. Pride says, I can cope. Pride says, I don't need help. Pride says, I can beat this addiction to sin on my own. Pride says, I'm a sovereign being. I don't want to submit to another Lord. But here the leper is doing exactly the opposite. He's saying, I need you. He's saying, I have no claim on you. My only hope is your mercy. But coming on his knees doesn't just mean that he came humbly. If you look at the old translation of the Bible, the authorised version, it says he came worshipping. And they've used, used that word because the, the word that's used for kneeling uh, is, is a word used in a special sense. It, it's used to describe kneeling in the presence of the divine. We hear a lot about taking the knee these days, don't we? Uh, whatever the rights and wrongs of the Black Lives Matter movement, a lot of people take the knee, probably more out of um, convention than conviction, not wanting to, to, to be different from anybody else. But here he's coming, on his knees, aware that he's kneeling before the divine. Do you see how he addressed Jesus? Lord. That's what his kneeling meant. Do you remember Jesus' words? Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. On that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and cast out demons in your name and do many mighty works in your name? And then I would declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. That doesn't describe this leper. His attitude was one of worship. Don't make the mistake of thinking that if you call Jesus Lord, you're secure. You know, you come to church when there's church, you tune into a service when there's a service, you pray your prayers, you sing hymns, you talk the talk, but unless you've truly come on your knees to Jesus in worship, not literally, necessarily, but figuratively. Coming on your knees with a cry of brokenness, as this leper did, you haven't come to him at all. And you risk him saying to you also, depart from me, I, I, I never knew you. Are you as desperate as this leper for forgiveness and cleansing? Do you cling to those words, whoever comes to me I will never cast out, words of Jesus? Then come as he did, on your knees, crying, Lord, and applying for his saving power to work in your life. Don't, don't sit in silence. Don't wait for another day. Don't hold out a hope that there might be another way. There isn't. But I want you to see one more thing about this, this leper as we're looking at this. See also that he came with confidence in Jesus' ability and power to help him. No one should ever feel himself incurable or unforgivable while Jesus Christ exists. You can make me clean, he says. 
He's not making his faith conditional upon uh, his feeling, you know, Lord, um, heal me and I'll trust you. Uh, I'll believe if you fix me. Do this and I'll follow you. Here's a man who trusts Jesus, come what may. If you will, you can heal me. But if not, it's not because you don't have the power to. I believe you because of who you are. And I believe that you can help me. You can do this. I believe I matter to you. You've come down from the mountain with the crowds. But you've stopped for me. This Jesus has come down the mountain, come down from heaven for you. He's stopped for this moment for you. No one else matters at this moment but you and Jesus. He will not pass until the matter's done. Are you convinced that he's interested in you? Do you know in your heart that you're personal to him? Then cry to him, just like this leper cried to Jesus. So there we are as we're following this story through. We've seen that this man needed to acknowledge his need, and so do you. The second thing we saw was that this leper cried to Jesus, cried out to Jesus, and so must you. But I said there were three things needed. What's the third thing? It's the willingness of Jesus. It's not just enough for us to be convinced he's able. Or, or that he's, just, he's got the power to help. He needs to be willing. Please note again what happened here. Picture the scene. Jesus, normally surrounded by the crowds, is now on his own with this man. The man's on his knees. His head's also bowed in humility, probably, and worship. And he cries, Lord, if you will, you can make me clean. And the crowd's hushed. They're watching from a distance and they're waiting. He's taught the crowds, but he's now willing to help this leprous outcast. Just one man in need. And the answer to the leper's cry, if you are willing, is a resounding, yes, I am willing. Mark tells us in his account of the story that Jesus was moved with pity. He reaches out his hand, he touches him. He doesn't have to do that. But the leper needed that touch. The crowd needed to see that touch. And he says to the man, I will be clean. And immediately, immediately, his leprosy was clean, cleansed. The creator and Lord of the universe is willing to save. What a great message that is for us to hear this morning. Willing enough to come down from heaven. Willing enough to empty himself, to take the form of a servant, to be born in the likeness of men. And be willing to humble himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on the cross. He went to the cross to bear God's punishment for our sins. For the leper. For everyone else who will ask. In the case of bodily sickness, we don't have a promise that Jesus will heal everyone who asks. Paul had his thorn in the flesh and he asked God to remove it and it wasn't taken away. 
Often God can achieve more in our lives through sickness and in health. So don't take from this story or from anywhere or from anyone else that Jesus doesn't ever want you to be ill. That's not what this story is about. That's actually, that is, is a false message. It's a false gospel. Of course, we may pray for healing, but always like this leper, if you are willing. But in the case of sin and salvation, we're assured from the Bible that Jesus desires all people to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. He's willing. Whoever comes to me, I will never cast out, he said. For I've come down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. And this is the will of him who sent me, that I should lose nothing of all that he's given me, but raise it up on the last day. For this is the will of my Father, that everyone who looks on the Son and believes in him should have eternal life, and I will raise him up on the last day. What this leper needed to know was that Jesus was willing, that he was willing to use his power for the leper's benefit. He needed to know miraculous love as well as miraculous power. And he found that he was willing. And Jesus stretched out his hand and touched him, we read, saying, I will be clean. And immediately his leprosy was cleaned, was cleansed. His life was changed forever. There were three things he needed. He needed an awareness of his need. He needed to cry, to ask, and he needed Jesus' willingness as well. Where do you stand? Do you know that you need this saving power of Jesus to change your life? Then cry out to him. Say, Lord, if you're willing, cleanse me, forgive me, save me, change me. And on the authority of God, on the authority of the teaching of the word of God, I can assure you that Jesus is willing.